Good afternoon. Wonderful to see so many people here. Uh, this is very exciting. Uh, welcome to the 25th anniversary Stanley P. Stone Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Natalie McKnight. I'm the Dean of the College of General Studies, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here uh, to host this event. Before I introduce the founder of the series and then today's speaker, I just want to remind you to please turn off cell phones. Thank you. Uh, due to the generosity and continued commitment of Mr. Stanley Stone, who established the Stanley P. Stone Distinguished Lecture Series in 1989, the College of General Studies presents at least one guest lecturer or performer each year. Over the past 25 years, we've enjoyed presentations by E.O. Wilson, Richard Rodriguez, Miriam Margulies, and many other outstanding performers and lecturers. I am pleased to say, bizarrely, I have been to every single Stanley P. Stone lecture for 25 years, and I have uh, really enjoyed the way that um, these presentations have enriched the conversations among students and faculty and people in the larger BU and Boston community. Mr. Stone, the founder of the series, received his degree in business administration from Questrom in 1966 after having completed the course of study at the College of General Studies. He received an MBA degree from Columbia University in 1972, and he is now president of Stanley P. Stone & Associates in New York. Please join me in thanking Mr. Stone for his active support of this distinguished lecture series. Stan? Like the drama. I am particularly grateful to Stan today because his generosity has enabled us to bring one of my personal heroes to campus, and that is Dr. Paul Farmer. Medical anthropologist and physician Paul Farmer is a founding director of Partners in Health, an international nonprofit organization that provides direct health care services and has undertaken research and advocacy activities on behalf of those who are sick and living in poverty. Dr. Farmer and his colleagues in the U.S. and in Haiti, Peru, Russia, Rwanda, Lesotho, and Malawi have pioneered novel community-based treatment strategies that demonstrate the delivery of high-quality health care in resource-poor settings. Dr. Farmer is the recipient of numerous honors, including the Margaret Mead Award from the American Anthropological Association, the Outstanding International Physician Nathan Davis Award from the American Medical Association, a John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, and with his partners in health colleagues, colleagues, the Hilton Humanitarian Prize. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Paul Farmer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Wow. Tough crowd. You're supposed to laugh. I said, tough crowd. Please don't be a tough crowd. There's no reason to be a tough crowd. Well, thank you for filling up this, uh, this hall. Um, I love how the dean just said uh, that the Stones had enabled her to bring me, one of her heroes, but, which is you know, terrific. But I'm right across the street. I'll come anytime you yell. <laughs> so. And uh, it is, a, and I also want to thank uh, Stan Stone for um, supporting the, the lecture series and for allowing me to come back. It's, it's been way too long. It's been uh, since I've had a chance to uh, speak at BU, and then it's usually at, um, at the School of Public Health or, a med or the medical area, so it's nice to be over here. Partners in Health is about spit and distance, as we used to say in Florida. And, uh, and I see a lot of you hanging around autos or the coffee shop. Nobody ever says hi. Actually, actually, that's why I know the BU students are pretty nice, because people do say hi, which uh, we like that. Um, so I was instructed by the dean. I think it was the dean who said, oh, just give us a little overview of, and I quote, the current state of global health. <laughs> this is, I didn't make that up in four minutes. And so as I thought about um, but I, I'm in the middle of writing something about uh, the Ebola epidemic, but you know, not just thinking about it as something that began in December of 2013 and you know, is, and it's 
final throes. Epidemics are never like that. So that's been on my mind. And then the current state of global health, thank you, Marjorie. Um, that's a big, tall order. So I went back and looked at what I said the last time I was at BU about the current state of global health. But I also thought, as I always do when I come here, about Martin Luther King and the human rights arguments and arguments about human dignity. So I've tried to weave those all together in four minutes. Um, and then I'll kick it open. Are we, am I allowed to have 40 minutes, but I'm allowed to have a Q&A. All right. So I may speed things up a bit. First, I, you won't, I'm not going to keep going back to human rights arguments, um, because they, they're almost like a, the, the bottom floor of an edifice that we should all be living in as humans. Right? And, and I go back again and again and again, as everyone at Partners in Health does, because the, they're really, it's hard. You can find lots of other arguments to do good things to prevent illness or to, to look after people who are facing both poverty and disease. Indeed, somehow we got it right when we were students, I think, in choosing as a mission for Partners in Health. And, and when I say students, we were able to work with um, people who weren't students, of course, our Haitian colleagues, although many of them were students as well, people like Tom White here in Boston, uh, uh, one of the founders of Partners in Health, a friend of mine from college, Todd McCormick, also here. But really, most of us were students. And um, we got it right, I think, to make a preferential option for the poor in health care um, was a pretty sound way to start. And it, it's later, uh, in the course of many defeats, I might add, uh, add, that we thought just how lucky we were to have made that the mission statement and so, instead of some other that might have come up and that I learned about. I want to peer around, see everybody, at Harvard Medical School um, and at the Graduate School of Arts and Science. So I was going between Harvard and Haiti, and still am, in fact. That's now 35 years, pretty soon. Um, 32. And I learned a lot about other arguments for investments in healthcare. For example, economic arguments, right? And that was good to learn about, right? You found out that we shouldn't be arguing with people about investments in healthcare systems because it makes good economic sense. We could use what are called at the School of Public Health um, public goods for public health and well-being, right? Like a health system that says, you know, you really ought to vaccinate your kids. In fact, it says you must, unless you're from California. <laughs> um, I just said that out in California, and there was a nerve, no. Um, but then finally, so you think about this, and many of I wish someone had said this to when I was an undergraduate. How many of you are undergraduates? All right. How many of you are grad students? Well, I, I could say, how many of you are homeless, because I have given lectures in Paris where at least half of the people who attended them were homeless. It was open to the public, and they served food. I was actually rather proud. Um, but I wish someone had said this to me, that there are complementary ways of justifying health and social justice, because that's what you end up doing when you fight for this, as many of you know, because the, in contrast to when I was an undergraduate 35 years ago, a lot of undergraduates are interested in, committed to, health and social justice. So one are economic justifications. But when they don't work, when someone says, well, it's not cost effective to do X, Y, or Z thing, or not sustainable, or not feasible, and we get that all the time, then you say, OK, well, we got another logic, public goods for public health. right? You don't take care of tuberculosis free of charge to the patient. It spreads. right? But if that doesn't work, go back to this. Right? Because you're allowed to say that people should have rights just because they're human. And I strongly recommend that you master, regardless of what your interests are as a student, master all three. Or, or I've not mastered all three after 35 years, but get familiar with them. Now, uh, this is what I talked about last time I was here. And I'm going to speed this up because I have, I could spend a, the whole 30 minutes on this, and that's probably not interesting. We can go back to this. But over these 30 years of going, or 35, however many, between Harvard and Haiti, um, here's some things I've seen recur every time, and including every epidemic. Right? 
And uh, when I was, uh, when I left Haiti um, to interview at Harvard Medical School, I went to Duke uh, as an undergraduate, then Duke, Haiti, Harvard, in the December of 1983. And there, I had heard of AIDS, but really it hadn't come out to, it was an urban, a problem of urban, the urban United States, we thought. We didn't know it was a problem of urban everywhere, but, and, and urban Haiti, but I really hadn't seen it. The first case that we would see in rural central Haiti, where I was living and working in a squatter settlement, was in 1986. And I would later um, do my doctoral dissertation in anthropology, looking at that. But from then on, uh, I saw these fights where you would pit prevention against care which is a, a dumb thing to do. And if for years I would not say this, but I'm gonna say it now. Um, when I was a medical student, uh, I was crossing Fresh, uh, Huron Avenue right near Fresh Pond Parkway and I walked right in front of a car. And anybody studying physics? <laughs> P equals MB. Momentum equals mass times velocity. I lost the struggle. And I was thrown into the air, and I thought, oh my god, and now a bus is going to hit me. Because the bus was bearing down on me. The bus swerved. and So I'm sitting there with my leg cocked over like this. I'm thinking, thank you, Jesus. I didn't get hit by the bus. You know, and then the ambulance attendant, the emergency medical technicians came. Now, if I had been a poor person in Haiti, they would have leaned over and said, you should have looked both ways before you crossed the street. That's what we do to poor people. We're saying, you get prevention. We get care, right? You try treating cancer, like my colleague, where are you, Cyprian? Right, they're right there, from Rwanda. All the time, we're to, he's from rural Rwanda, no less, where he runs, helps to run a, a cancer center and deliver care in a place that has, I bet you there's nowhere else in rural Africa where there is a cancer treatment center. So there again, it's prevention versus care. And people like Cyprien have said, no, that's not going to work. Absence of specialists, right? There, I, there was a time in Rwanda and in Haiti where I was the only infectious disease doctor in a huge district. And probably, with the exception of a couple in Kigali who were focused on research in 2004, the only one in the country. I, I think that's hardly an exaggeration. So when we talk about task shifting to others, it was really not shifting from someone who was doing the work to someone else. No one was doing that work. So it wasn't really task shifting, but it's an important thing to think about. Weak infrastructure. By the way, these are reasons not to do the right thing. We have to focus on prevention rather than care. We have to acknowledge there are no specialists. We have to we have weak infrastructure. Uh, there are. There, there are fixed costs. Look how, how, can, you know, how can something be cost effective like AIDS treatment when it costs $15,000 per patient per year? And then you stop. It gets intimidating to hear that stuff, right? But if you say, well, what if healthcare is a human right? And what if AIDS is the leading killer of young adults in African cities as in American cities? Then you have to say, you have to go back and look at these claims. Like how much does it cost to treat AIDS? When someone says $15,000 per patient per year, they're talking about the price. And uh, you, know, you finally get up a little courage and say, wait, cost and price are different, aren't they? Of course they are, right? But these are often ways to stop the conversation. And then finally, one of the things we learned how to do was to say, it costs a lot to do nothing. And that's what happened, of course, with AIDS. And this is what happened with Ebola, as I'll show you. And, and then finally, after a while, you realize that some of the people were saying, well, it's, you have to focus on prevention rather than care. You don't have the specialists. You don't have the infrastructure. It costs too much. You know, we, we can't afford to do this action. It's not sustainable. After a while, you realize this is said to stop these conversations rather than to start them. Don't let that happen in a university, you know, here in this university. It's always got to be about starting conversations. Now those I will save for you. Now let me give an illustration. Um, and I just a brief history of, not zoonoses, although if you look over there for any of you nerd, lab nerds, you might recognize the one at the bottom, that is HIV. There's a three zoonoses, probably 
from the same part of the world um, and that have burst onto the scene, sometimes in pandemic form like AIDS, but the other two, the top one is Marburg and the middle one is Ebola. Marburg is a very interesting story. Um, now, why does it have a, anybody know where Marburg is? Preach it. It's a city in Germany. You didn't know, I knew it. <laughs> Dean Marjorie, these kids are awesome. It's a city in Germany because these are lab researchers who were working with primates, non-human primates, from, I think, Uganda, via London into Marburg, where, boom, a number of lab techs who were handling cell cultures from these monkeys fell ill with a devastating disease characterized by, guess what, vomiting, diarrhea, they didn't know what it was. But the electron microscope had come along and people were discovering new viruses quite a bit. And so in 1967, they, did, they, they realized it was a, not a pathogen. New just means newly discovered. And it spread to two other cities, Frankfurt, Germany, and Belgrade, and then Yugoslavia, before people figured out it was spread by person-to-person -person transmission. And Ebola was much the same mode of transmission. It was discovered actually by a good friend of mine um, who was 27 years old from Belgium. He was working in a lab there. He was an infectious disease doctor also. And the hilarious part of his story to his friends is when they were sent this, novel, this virus that they identified as a novel virus, and it wasn't Marburg, it looked like Marburg, tasted like Marburg, I'm kidding. Um, they said, well, we should go to, Z it would, Zaire had been a Belgian uh, colony, which is kind of hilarious when you think how small Belgium is and how big Zaire is. Kind of goofy, really. Any historians here? Somebody laughed a little bit. <laughs> Colonialism was, it wasn't goofy, it was bad, but <laughs> anyway. <clears throat> so my friend, Peter Piot, is a great man. He says, let's go to Zaire, just what I would have said at 27. I hope I'd still say it now. And off they go. And he doesn't even have a viable passport because he'd cut his picture out for a gym membership. <laughs> the, man, the man I say should win a Nobel Prize, and he cut his own passport up. Anyway, <laughs> that's the thing about former colonies. You really don't need your passport to get in. So he goes to this little village, and this picture of this poor nun, it had mown through a mission hospital, again, just like it did through these lab workers, only much, much worse, because there was no stopping it without what are called barrier precautions. And what are those? Gloves, gowns. In fact, in this mission hospital, as Peter Piot later marveled, there wasn't even a doctor. And he thought, he said, in fact, what kind of hospital doesn't have a doctor? And he learned the answer, a lot of hospitals, mission hospitals, and I'm no doctor. And the nurses, I'm not saying they're undertrained, but they were reusing the same needles to do prenatal care, right? Not just vaccination, bad enough, but to give useless shots, uh, you know, vitamin shots during prenatal care. That's what amplified the epidemic. And that's been the pattern every time. You're told that there's been 25 epidemics of Ebola. Don't believe it. I mean, how could they know, right? Think about it. If there isn't the staff or the stuff or the space or the systems, meaning the stuff includes laboratory diagnosis, how are you going to know? I told you what the uh, presenting symptoms were. Ten points to Gryffindor if anybody can tell me what they were. <laughs> Diarrhea, vomiting, fever. Okay, stop there. You... Now, tell me, you're in the middle of rural Zaire, rural Sierra Leone, rural Liberia. What kind of things cause nausea, vomiting, fever? This is the part where I get to torture the translator. <laughs> Normally I wouldn't even say, chikungunya virus. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll stop because she's going to win. Every, you know, it's humbling. I wish I could say these in any other language, but anyway. It's, it's impossible to know without the, the staff, the stuff, the space, and the system. Some of you are working in laboratory science. Some of you go into microbiology. You know, still an interesting field after 150 years. But you need the stuff. You know, you need 
and, and it's not present. So every Ebola epidemic, by the way, when you heard that it was the first time there had been Ebola in West Africa, you should be saying, oh, really? <laughs> I said that, you know? I said, really? How would you know? I don't believe it. Why? I mean, whatever is in that forest, whatever animal is carrying it, why wouldn't it be? It's a continuous forest. You ever look at a map of Africa? It used to be called the Upper Guinea Forest. That's where Guinea is, hint. Upper Guinea Forest, Liberia and Sierra Leone. And it stretches, you know, it looks continuous to me. I'm flying over it, I'm staring at the map, I'm thinking, how could, they, how could anyone say it's new? That doesn't make any sense. So don't believe it. You have to have staff stuff, space, and systems to know what's causing people to fall so ill. So let me give an example, but they're all the same. Now, I know you've all read my book, Infections and Inequalities. Judging by sales, only Stan Stone has actually read it. <laughs> um, now, maybe the reason it's done so poorly is that I put picture, a picture of dead people on the cover. <laughs> My editor said, that's a bad marketing strategy. And I insisted, you know, and it, not, and it was out of respect, because these people are dead of Ebola. This is a mass grave in Kikwi. Uh, another town. These are not villages, by the way. These are big towns. Guecadu, where this started, I'll show you in a minute. This is a quarter of a million people, you know? And they've, that's the thing about working there, as I finally did, is these places have been around forever with the same or similar name. So you're looking at a map saying, oh my God, I've been there, and there it is in the 15th century. There it is in the 16th century. And they'd be, you know, wiped out by slavery or people running from slavery but the, places, the place names would show up again. Anyway, Kikwit, same story, no infection control. Someone comes in with a kid or a family member who's sick with this syndrome of nonspecific complaints, and uh, it just kill, takes out the nurses and doctors, and that's when you hear about it. It's not when it kills poor people in some rural village. So again, how would you know? You had a great surveillance system anywhere there, maybe, but a bad surveillance system you know, and it's a disease of poor people, be very suspicious. That was 15 years ago I wrote that book, by the way. I'm not bragging, I'm just saying. All right, now here's the bad part, meaning mouse. I don't like mice. I don't like rats. They transmit many diseases, and I'll name them as I'm just trying to find out how to. Don't worry, I'll get it, I'll get it. Could some 18-year-old please help me? All right. <laughs> Now I press the red thing, let's give it a try. Should I? Oops, shit. Oops, I didn't say that. <laughs> Dean, Dean Marjorie, I did not swear. Oops, no, that's not gonna do. Help. <laughs> Caitlin, Caitlin, get my back. So, let me just, this is the, the, the brief story. In December, and it, she, Katie said anywhere you click on the black. In December of 1983, a two-year-old kid, his name's Emil, falls ill with guess what? fever, diarrhea, vomiting, two years old, it's nonspecific. His mother's worried enough to take him from a village called Meliandu about five miles to the city of Guecadu to the public hospital. No one notices when he dies except his family, then his sister, then his mother, then his grandmother, and then the nurses and later the doctors. And then it spread within a few, a few months, it's already gone out of this region called the Tri-Zone area where those three countries come together into the towns and cities of all three countries and was recognized as Ebola in April of 2014. By the summer, which is when I first traveled to Sierra Leone, it was out of control. We didn't know, we knew that actually. We knew that, I'll, I'll return to that. And, uh, and it was a long time before, it seemed to me, before we got back as partners in health. I only knew three Sierra Leoneans in June of 2014 when we went there. We had helped to organize a surgical conference with colleagues at Harvard Medical School. Some of you have maybe worked with them. And uh, we had planned three international conferences on surgical care for the poor and underserved. The first one of the three was at Harvard. We launched this at Harvard. The third one was in Dubai, 
And so, as you can imagine, we said, we got to have the second meeting in Africa. Not in South Africa, not in North, northern countries, and not in Rwanda, where things are on the right track. If somewhere else in this medically needy part of the world. And that is one of the reasons we ended up in Sierra Leone. Well, in May, I started getting emails um, about, well, you got to move the venue. We were sponsoring, a friend of mine had paid for much of the meeting so that people from across Africa could come. And uh, you know, I said, no, you don't get Ebola by attending medical conferences. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> well, we, you know, we, we did, lest I be too self-congratulatory, Paul, um, we did insist, we had the conference, and these are the three guys I knew, all three doctors. By November, two were dead of Ebola, and the third was working full time, this guy over here, with Partners in Health. So there's, you know, the, people will say, well, how do we successfully stop Ebola? I would say we did not do things right. You know, there should not have been all this loss. And I don't even think we know how many people were sick. I've already told you, I don't believe for a minute that we know when the other outbreaks have happened in the course of the last, whatever, millennium, including the last, since 1976. And we don't know how many people were infected because we don't understand the pathophysiology of the disease. And we don't know how many people are going to be affected in the future. Now, why is this? I already told you, it's a caregiver's disease, right? Mom carries baby to hospital without infection control, reaches nurses, eventually doctors, although there are very few in the region, um, and then people know about it. That's what happened in 1976. You know, it also took out the priests and the nuns who were doing the nursing work, the nuns, and, uh, and the nurses. Same story every time. It's a disease of caregivers. You could say an infection control disease, but that hardly captures the drama, the mortal peril. And for my colleagues, my, my two friends, Humar Khan and Martin Salia, Martin Salia was one of the only surgeons left in Sierra Leone, which as you, you may not know, but everyone should know, was laid low by war. 10 years of brutal, violent, some people say civil war, but it was organized banditry to control the diamond mines of Sierra Leone. And both of these guys who perished, Martin is in the middle. Is that a TV show? Martin, it, Martin is in the middle with a stethoscope. I mean, they, and interestingly or tragically, they're both 41, which may seem old to you, but seems awfully young to me. He's one of the only surgeons left, you know? And, uh, and the other guy, who Mark Hahn, even more grotesquely, was the only specialist in viral hemorrhagic fevers in the area. In other words, he was an Ebola expert. And they stood their ground and took care of people knowing that they were in mortal peril. And they died, as, as did their colleagues, their nursing colleagues. The third, I'm happy to tell you, is alive and well. And, uh, you know, he's a name, uh, Byler Berry, great guy. And we were lucky enough to be working with them uh, in Eastern, with him and his group in Eastern Sierra Leone. Now, why do I have the chimpanzee up in the corner? Because that's the cover of Newsweek at the time when my respected colleague, Humar Khan, lay dying. By the way, he was supposed to spend the year at Harvard this year. You know, very well-known infectious disease doctor. And I'm picking up the cover of Newsweek and it says, you know, back door for Ebola, eating chimpanzees. This was the front door, taking care of people without the tools of the trade. And then if you look at people who aren't professionals, which of course we did by partner, when Partners in Health finally got there in, uh, in September and started working with survivors who are just right out of the, the Ebola treatment units. More on that in a second. These are three young people I met in Freetown, the capital of Sierra Leone. Uh, in early October 2015, 2014. It seems like 10 years ago for me, by the way. 10 years, 15, 20 years. And it was a year ago today that Martin Salia fell ill and shortly thereafter died. These three lost a big portion of their families. 
and it, you interview them, and now they're friends of mine, but that was the, this is the first day probably that I met them, and my colleague, Beck Rollins, who's a photographer and the director of communications for Partners Now, took these pictures as we were talking. This one over here, they're all connected, you know. This is her boyfriend, father of baby, and uh, it was, I could get this wrong, but it's pretty close and I can correct it. But I think it was, yeah, it was her father who went to take care of his father who was a traditional healer. In the absence of professional biomedical practitioners, and there aren't a lot of them, as I said, what do you think people do when they're sick? They go to traditional healers or whoever is there. And her grandfather was a traditional healer. He felt sick. His son, her father, went to take care of him. The father died. His wife died. Then her father is sick, comes back to Freetown. She's nursing him. He dies. Her best friend, this is a teenager, is staying there helping care for uh, her friend's father. And they both, and he, when he, he the, the guy in the middle, father of baby, takes care, uh, care helps to bury the, the father. I mean, what, you think there's a funeral home they're calling back then? Uh, they're not only caring for people, <clears throat> but like everyone who has a, claims a religious tradition, you just think of your own. You know, maybe you're Catholic. Or as my grandmother would say, maybe you're Catholic or otherwise Christian. <laughs> she said that suspiciously. That meant you were a Protestant. Or Jewish, <clears throat> or, or your faith is Islam. Every single one of them buries the dead. That's some kind of, I believe it's a corporal work of mercy. I'm looking at a friend of mine who's a theologian, right? So of course they buried their dead. Of course they prepared them for burial. And that's again how they feel ill. It's a caregiver's disease. And when, you, when you've lost people you know, or know people who've fallen ill with Ebola, and you see the whole claims about exotic bushmeat or exotic funerary practices, we call those funerals in the United States. But anthropologists, now fortunately I am a card-carrying anthropologist. I didn't mention that, did I? I also have a PhD in anthropology. I'm a nerd, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> so I did my MD and a PhD at the same time, and in anthropology. And it's been remarkable to me to see how the exoticization of illnesses that afflict, sometimes wipe out the poor, how that happens every time. Now, what do you do about it? That was the big question. Between when we left, I think it was June 21st or 22nd, Martin Salia <clears throat> was still alive. Humar Khan was still alive. A lot of people were still alive. But in between then and when we got back in October, the Western surge had already was under full force. That means the surge from the east to the west. That, by the way, is the same term they used during the so-called rebel war. I told you they weren't rebels, they were bandits. Right? They were trying to control the diamond fields. Um, $72 billion industry, by the way, diamonds. Mostly American, you know, meaning we buy most of the diamonds. And um, so the Western surge that Ebola took came into a place that had been devastated by war. Liberia, too, devastated by war. So you could say, well, Guinea didn't have a civil war. Well, if a quarter of all Sierra Leoneans were camped out in Guinea, Guinea had a little... Civil War too, right? This is a regional war that was global. It reached all over the world. In other words, it involved huge numbers of combatants, just there, maybe 100,000, killed, killed or displaced, killed or maimed millions, right? And displaced huge fraction of the population in that region, right? And it was high-tech weapons that were not manufactured in that region. So, it was a, it's a very scary thing to contemplate. Now, what's left after war is usually like this, nothing. This is a, a picture, and I saw it many times, but I saw this one, in, this is August 15th, New York Times. That's an Ebola treatment unit. Now, you tell me how much treatment could be going on in an ETU that looks like that. And the answer is not a lot. And these are the kind of places you wouldn't want your friends to go to, you wouldn't want your worst enemies to go to. And <clears throat> now compare the case fatality rate of another viral hemorrhagic fever, the same one we talked about, Marburg, in Germany, 
in, in Central Europe, that is Frankfurt, Belgrade, and Marburg in 1967 to the case fatality rates in April, I mean in Africa decades later. And this is various sites in Africa. And then you have to ask, oh really, now what is this? Is it a different strain of Marburg? That's the default explanation, right? But it's not a different strain. And the same tr thing was true with Ebola. Enormous variation. You know, having known uh, some of the Americans who fell ill with Ebola, which is very frightening for us, all of us, I mean, for those who knew them, know them, I say know them because no Americans died. Uh, among people who were airlifted out to Europe or North America to safety in a proper ICU where Ebola treatment could be delivered, uh, the fat case fatality rate was probably 15 to 20 percent, depending on age. But in many places, in March of this year, again, seems like 10 years ago, in the last significant cluster in Liberia, uh, and victory was declared over it, by the way. It's like, oh man, we really sealed it off. But guess what the case fatality rate was in that cluster? 100%. So we could declare victory if everybody died, but you stopped transmission. I mean, I think that's wrong. And that, th who says that? These are my peers and friends. They're running the show, you know, I know, I know them saying, wait, we can't say we did good if everybody died. You know, just because we stopped it, it's two jobs we had, integrating prevention and care. But this disease control only paradigm was what dominated during the Ebola outbreak. Until it got completely out of control, in which case people said, well, maybe we should deliver good care and treatment in places that are called ETU, where the T means treatment. Very bitter discussion and still going on, as you might imagine. Now, the, the task is really to integrate prevention and care, and that requires a lot of people. And a lot of people were marshaled, um, and I'm not saying people didn't try hard, I just think we should, we should admit that we didn't do very well if case fatality remained high and the disease spread, uh, which is what happened. And it will happen again as long as there's no health system. So when you hear some of your friends, undergraduates who are taking classes in global health, talk about health system strengthening, don't get too bored, because even though it's boring to talk about, that's the task at hand. You have to build a health system if there isn't one. That's what's happened in Rwanda. And in fact, in the, since the first time that I went to Rwanda, I got this in maybe 15, 16 years ago, I got to see that happen. I, and I'm lucky because Partners in Health was part of it. I got to see the elaboration over a really short amount of time of a health system that could do a lot to stop an illness and to take care of people, both. I mean, 21 years ago, Rwanda was just as bad as any place in the world, if not worse, and that includes Sierra, Sierra Leone and Liberia, the bottom of the barrel. In fact, people wrote off, I, I mean, I'm old enough so that I remember very well, because I was you know, already a professor at Harvard Medical School, an attending physician at the Brigham Women's Hospital, I remember people saying, Rwanda, man, can you believe the savagery of this? Well, it's savage, right? But then the next thing would be, it'll ne they'll never get over, it's a, get over it. It's a failed state, a lost cause. I heard that all the time. You're a little young to, to have heard that, Cyprian, but that gives me hope to know that Rwanda turned around, things around in less than two decades and to be able to see it, I think maybe it's m one of the most wonderful things I've ever seen. The way that if you actually build a health system, they did, and we were glad to be part of it, you can see, it's like you could watch mortality drop. Under five mortality, infant mortality means under one, maternal mortality, and death due to AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. I wonder why those three. Oh yes, because we actually funded treatment for AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria. And that's going to happen with cancer once we stop saying, oh, cancer is not a disease in four countries. Now, staff stuff, space, and system. Let me zip through this so we have time. It seems to me pretty sad, and I, this is a bit of a, you know, cliche to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway, that some people 
who you might know if you were a doctor working in Sierra Leone or Liberia, would die because they didn't have gloves. When Liberia has the largest rubber plantation in the world, or did until fairly recently. By the mid, this is since 1926, uh, when Firestone, which you've heard of Firestone, right? Signed a one million acre, one million acre concession for five cents an acre. You know, a pretty big company. About half of the American automobiles in the mid 20th century had a little bit of Liberian rubber in them. So to not have gloves, oh, the pain, you know, to not have what got called PPE, personal protective equipment. And uh, this is, again, you need staff, stuff, space, and systems. Now, space, you know, and, and you know, the stuff is we didn't have back then and still really don't have specific treatment, right, an antiviral that we know works against Ebola. We did not have a vaccine. Now we kind of do, which, again, I hope we get to talk about research. But when someone is sick from what's called hypovolemic shock, and some of you will know that hypovolemic shock is what results when you have nausea, <coughs> diarrhea, fever, and don't get replacement. And the replacement therapy means you replace fluid and electrolytes. You know, we've known this since World War I or shortly thereafter. So again, oh, the pain of not having gloves, but oh, the pain of not seeing people aggressively rehydrated. You know, well, I don't want to go into it too much, but my, let's just say that my doctor friends in those, after, you know, in those countries uh, did not get the kind of care that they deserved. This little baby, I had nothing to do with saving her. She was left for dead uh, in a house where they said everybody died, her family. And that had happened in many other houses, right? Because it's spread by caring for others. But the, when the burial team went there, by then they had burial teams, baby was alive. So they brought this baby to the Partners in Health team in a place called Port Loco. And, uh, but they couldn't get an IV in her. They couldn't, she couldn't sip fluids because she was so dehydrated. So they did what they do in Boston. This guy named Chuck Callahan actually said, oh, I have an interosseous needle. Stuck the needle in her bone, I think in her, between her, in her tibia, between her tibia and fibula. And then rehydrated her and then she could get an IV and then drink and she survived. You know, and they said, miracle baby. Right. I said, great. I mean, that's what, when you're there, you don't say, it's not a miracle. I just went, yeah, a miracle baby. And I'm thinking, what would happen if your kid was dehydrated and went to a children's hospital and didn't get treatment like that, didn't get rehydrated? You'd say, malpractice, right? But if it happens for poor babies, children, it's a miracle. And there's some truth to that. It's outrageously enough. A miracle. Now, some good things had come out of all this, and I, we'll talk about those if we can, but the space problem, and this is Port Loco. This is the, uh, over here, when we finally went there, we were assigned there. The Minister of Health on October 9th, his predecessor, by the way, had been fired maybe because our colleague had died. I mean, he's the most famous infectious disease doctor, and everybody in the world's kind of watching as he goes down the tubes, right? And I'm sure the government said, you can't let him die. We have to get him airlifted out of here. Didn't happen. It's another ugly part of the story. But we went and talked to the minister, and he said, look, you know, the east, the tri-zone area where you guys are going to work, it's too late. You need to be here in the city or in Port Loco. Go to Port Loco. And we said, OK. And on the way out the door, I said to Byler Berry, now working full time with us, Where's Port Loco? Never heard of it. That night in my room, I looked in, a, I had these 19th century books that I hope Harvard isn't still looking for. <laughs> and, um, and I just looked in the index and a map, and there's Port Loco, 17th century, 16th century, been there for a while. I'd never heard of it. And we got a sign there, and we knew that we were walking into a death trap, right? You look at it, the building we were assigned wasn't even 
It was not built for purpose, of course, but it wasn't even, it had been abandoned. It was closed. It was a vocational school named, in, in a place called Maforki, near, not too far from the government hospital. So we looked around. I wasn't there that day. Um, I believe it was October 26th, which I remember for a stupid reason, it's my birthday. <laughs> I'm not proud to say that, but that's probably the only reason I know, the first day. I, and I did say to my friends, the biggest birthday gift you can give me is to get our butts in gear and work with the people who already are obliged to do the work. Because some people were saying, we're not gonna work in a death trap. We're gonna build our own ETU, built for purpose. And you know, the obvious question is, how long would that take? If there are hundreds of people falling sick every week, and you say, well, we're gonna build our own built for purpose ETU, big problem. So, you know, I was on the phone with these guys. I was stuck, actually. Anybody remember Casey Hickox? Oh, the pain, first no gloves, then no space, then no stuff, then no memory. <laughs> and she was a nurse who, Governor Chris Christie, how many of you from New Jersey? <laughs> Don't get too enthusiastic, because what I'm gonna say <laughs> is not gonna reflect well on your state. <laughs> so she's coming back from West Africa. Volunteer, service, and Chris Christie says, well, I don't know if he really said it, but they stuck her in a tent and said, you can't go anywhere. Now, I'm on my way back. It's my birthday. I'm coming to Cambridge. There's a little birthday party for me at Rialto, my favorite restaurant. You've never been there. It's too expensive for students. <laughs> so, and then this happens, and I'm saying, I don't want to be in a tent on my birthday. You know, I don't want to be made an example of. Mr. Smarty Pants, Harvard doctor, think you can come in and go as you please. That was the sentiment. This is just before Martin Salia, the surgeon, fell ill. And I, I, I said, I don't want to do it. So I was stuck in, uh, in Morocco. There are worse places to be stuck than Marrakesh. <laughs> also, you shouldn't go there. You're too young. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I didn't, this seems like 10 years ago, you know, a year and a week ago, right? So I stayed there for an extra day or two and snuck back in my tail between my legs. You know, I didn't want, like I said, I didn't want to be, I, it felt like humiliation, okay? I'm embarrassed to say that. I didn't get sick with Ebola. I know people who did and died, and here I am feeling embarrassed and mad that that's the welcome we're getting after you have over 1,000 people volunteer for Partners in Health to go serve doctors, nurses, physician's assistants, and a lot of management people, and that's, that's what it felt like. So the space, we knew it was deadly. I was on the phone saying, uh, okay, what about the government hospital, which is right nearby? Well, that's where most of the people, something like 18 out of 20 staff there died of Ebola. Or 18 of the 20 healthcare workers, sorry, 18 of the 20 healthcare workers who died, died there. That's the number. And I'll, like I said, some of these numbers are a little bit loose, but I'll document everything I say eventually. And, uh, but what are you gonna do? We don't have time to build another ETU. Built for purpose, clean, safe. We had to go into that, I can't say it, hell hole anyway, and try and help. And I'm proud to tell you that some months later, we figured out that 8% of the people who survived came out of that one little decrepit. I mean, our goal was to save a lot more, but working with the public sector, and the Cubans, by the way, funny how we always end up working with the Cubans in Haiti, everywhere. They're there, they're very, they show up. This is what my friend Jenny, the theologian aforementioned, calls the ministry of showing up. Cubans have been good at that. And of course, there were others working there, um, but I'm, I'm proud of the PIH team, and I appreciate those of you who supported them and us in that difficult time. This is where we ended up working. I'm gonna, not going to spend time. There's a reason for the places. But here's the task before us now. People say, well, you know, Ebola. You guys wiped that out, right? It's over. And the, you, know, you could say, well, maybe. I mean, but I just say, yeah, it's wiped out, but so is the health system, gone. 
completely gone. So if there's no healthcare system, what happens? I mean, this is just looking at maternal deaths. There, if there's no family planning, added the good Catholic boy, there's gonna be maternal deaths in the absence of modern obstetric care. And where does family planning come from? It comes from public clinics usually. And what if they're closed because of Ebola? They are. This is, what, this is one guess, this is what happens. So Sierra Leone already had the worst maternal mortality on the planet, right? And now it's worse. Look at measles vaccination, pertussis. We're in a big, we have a lot of work before us and people have already forgotten, turned away. We have all this work to do now. So those of you who are support partners in health, keep doing. Now, let me close, and I really mean it this time, what never happens in an emergency. I've lived through a few. I, I have not courted them. You know, I wanted to be in West Africa. Here's a good story for BU students. You know, sometimes people say to me, and it's been asked before, you know, this, your life seems to be really working out well. You know, you guys have a lot of success. You know, does anything ever go wrong for you? I'm thinking, first of all, I hate heat. <laughs> I hate the tropics. I love the people there, but I don't like heat. I'm Irish, American type. You know, we're supposed to be living in a peat bog, mean temperature, 55, <laughs> all right? So I don't even like the heat. Um, and people have said to me, really, so if you don't like the heat, why did you go into tropical medicine? Not for the weather. <laughs> anyway. I was a senior at Duke, and I, 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 really, I wanted to go to guess where West Africa. And I applied for a Fulbright, and I thought, oh, I'm going to get it. I'm so smart. I have such good grades. I didn't even get an interview. So Haiti was plan B, which is a good thing for me, because it made my life, it certainly made me more effective, and our group more effective in West Africa. Of course, our group also included Haitians. They were leading teams, just like in, when we started in Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho. We relied on our colleagues from Haiti. And we learned during the earthquake, and again, many people from BU supported Partners in Health, that these are the three things that didn't happen, never happen after emergency. You don't build the health systems. There's not a focus on training and building local capacity. And there's no new knowledge generated. Wait, you can't go? Come back. <laughs> I'm just kidding. So now there's all these billions pledged for Ebola right? And we can do better this time. We can focus on building health systems, focus on training programs that are not fake training programs, and we can do, generate new knowledge. And to me, you know, when I look at the, ho the hospital that we built with the, for the public sector, for the Ministry of Health, for the people of Central Haiti, and some of you have been here, you know, this is with earthquake money. And if we had to ask for that money, from public sources, even if it had been donated for earthquake relief, we wouldn't have gotten it. It was donated to Partners in Health, and so we controlled it, and we said, we're building a hospital, a modern teaching hospital. In fact, we're gonna call it University Hospital. And people said, you can't call it University Hospital, there's no university here. And we said, yet. There isn't one university yet. Here's the first bit of it. And we did it. Thank you. That's what we should be doing in Sierra Leone and Liberia. That's what we're going to do in Sierra Leone and Liberia. And we need a lot of people to help us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my peeps. <laughs> my peeps, I give you. I'm not selling them. I'm the worst capitalist ever. You can have them. <laughs> I can't believe you guys are leaving. I'm so fun in Q&A.
Yeah, fair, fair, fair enough question. I will add, though, that I have lived in Rwanda for more than a decade, right? And mostly spent most of my time, and I've been going there for a long time, spent most of my time in rural areas. Let me tell you, when you're in rural areas, there's not a lot of masking, that, you know, hiding things, right? And it's true that I am not an expert in Rwandan language or culture. I admit it, because I'm an anthropologist. But I have been living there. Two of my children were born there. And that's not the Rwanda I know. I have certainly heard that echoed in some, usually European and some American human rights groups. But you know, to be really honest with you, is it, what's your, Brian? Garrett. Garrett. All those white people names sound alike. <laughs> um, you know, seriously, Garrett, I, I, I trust myself more. Is that outrageous to say, having lived there and worked there? And I read these things that don't square with my knowledge. And I learned this the hard way in, in Haiti, where I really did know the language, the culture. I'd worked there for 30 years. And I saw how unreliable some of that reporting was. That's point one. I, you, know, you have to you know, trust yourself a little bit and your colleagues. You know? And uh, I wouldn't say that we're dupes. Uh, I mean, maybe history will prove otherwise. I have no doubt that it won't. All right. Second point, I'm very interested in human rights. That's how I started the, uh, the lecture. And you, I was hoping someone would ask me, and you did. We need to think hard about social and economic rights. And those are not just civil and political rights, which we should also celebrate unambivalently and push forward, but the right to health care, which we do not have in this country, the right to education, which we fought for and barely maintained, the right to housing, the right to a job, these things are considered still kind of outrageous rights in some places. So when there is a right to health care, when there are efforts to build out a universal health access plan, as in Rwanda, I think all of us who care about health and well-being should acknowledge that as a big human rights victory. And uh, you know, I'm willing to stand for that one. Thank you. Can I pick up on the human rights issue? Knock yourself out. You're the dean. Yeah. Oh, here's another chance for me to confess something, like that I didn't even get a Fulbright interview. All right, here, I'm going to come clean. When I was a senior in high school in Hernando County, Florida, I was put into a program, state mandated, by the way, to help, as it was said in the day, I'm just using the language of the day, retarded kids and gifted kids. So you can decide how I fared in that. But so I was supposed to write a thesis. And I wrote my whole thesis, which was very poor quality, by the way. It was really bad, you know? And I wrote it about why socialized medicine is bad. Now let me ask you, and I'm embarrassed to have to say this, Mr. Ch Human Rights, Garrett, get my back, buddy. Mr. Human Rights Champion confesses publicly that his senior honors gifted thesis was on, I should have been, never mind. I was in the wrong program. Why we don't need a national health care program. Now I ask you, why would a kid living in, I'll just tell you, a bus, whose mother is a grocery store cashier, his father is sometimes working, sometimes not, family of eight, why would I ever say that? And to me, that just shows you how powerful propaganda is and can be. For an 18-year-old to, to say something like that, to write something like that, is, is sad to me. But that, you know what that has led me to do? It's led to me, I hope, to be merciful to young people in general. Like when they say the dumbass things they say <laughs> in my classes at Harvard, I'm not thinking, you know, I'm thinking, that's exactly what I said. So propaganda works, you know? You know what the name of my social studies class was? I, I graduated in 1978, and our class motto was, 78 is great. <laughs> the worst thing is I was the class president. 
I must have come up with that. You know the name of our, our, uh, our social studies class, you know? Not, it's not, you know, it was called ABC. Does anybody know what ABC means? Americanism versus communism. It's a cold, you know, we're living in the Cold War, so the answer to your question, I believe, is Cold War politics. You know, in the United States, we lifted up two great rights that we never have lived up to yet. We should keep lifting them, civil and political rights. We have to keep fighting. Right? We have to keep fighting. That's what Martin Luther King said, but he also said another thing. He said, we should be fighting imperial wars that we're involved in. We should be fighting poverty. He integrated the civil and political rights with the social and economic rights. And he, that's why, I mean, and then he's humble. He said, anybody can be great because anybody can serve. And I, I, I know after my foolishness, again, youthful foolishness of, and I could go on and on, but I won't. And it's not 78 is great, it's why, you know, why a national health care program is bad. Why would a kid like me say that? And I'm embarrassed by it. That's why I haven't said it publicly. Is this like taped and transmitted? <laughs> Did I sign something? Hi. Yeah. You know, I do. Um, I'm, I, I first learned it before Africa in Haiti. And that was very straightforward. You know, if you're a doctor, as you're about to be, or a nurse taking care of someone, let's say, with tuberculosis, or any other chronic disease, serious chronic disease, you, you can't do that yourself. You can prescribe medicines, but it, A, unless you're thinking about social and economic rights as well, and B, unless you're working with community health workers, you're not going to get really great outcomes, right? You will for some patients, but not for a lot of them. So that's one. We need community health workers in this country desperately. And when we say, when we say medical home, we don't even mean home-based care. We just mean your home clinic or home hospital. So we're not even able to see, just as I wasn't able to see when I was 18, what's wrong with our health care system. By the way, when I got hit by a car, I got great tertiary care. I did, and if you get hit by a car, you'll get great tertiary care. Or if you get leukemia, heaven for fen, you know, you'll get good care. But it's not enough, you know, and we need community health workers, and uh, you know, that's one of the things I learned. Now, in Rwanda, when I, when I saw the, the real impact on mortality of a system that went all the way from community to clinic where the majority of care should be delivered to uh, hospital, that's pretty powerful because it's a very poor country and with uh, under $70 per person expended, uh, that's, that's still too low. But we spend 10,000 per person per year, eight, between eight and 10,000, it depends on where, what state you're in. So we have a very weak healthcare system. Great tertiary care. I wouldn't want to work anywhere else but the Brigham, just to practice the joy of it, of working in a great hospital when you're a hospital-focused person. But that's my thing. That's not pathology, right? Most of it is not in the hospital, it's in the home. And we should take care of it there. Great question. Go ahead, clap. I mean, I'll feel good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, other what, nine? You know, that's a great question, the other nine departments, how have we done it just in Mirabale, which is actually the two departments, as you know, and maybe others don't, we were in two of 10 departments. In, in Rwanda, we're in three of 30 departments, they're called districts, and they're, but they're more or less the same. And the answer in Rwanda, and I'll go back to Haiti, is that we work with the Ministry of Health through policy change. And our street cred from delivery is what gives us the right, maybe, to work with them. They respect us because they know we've been living and working there. Is that fair, Dr. Cipriani? You like how I'm talking really fast? All right, in, in Haiti, I think we had the same street cred 
but it's a pretty weak ministry and got weaker after the earthquake, right? First of all, just the staff stuff, space systems. The Ministry of Health, six floors high. The next morning, it was one floor high. 20% of ministry employees were killed or maimed. So I'm loath to just say, oh, well, they're not good. I don't believe that. In fact, they have great leadership, Thomas Guillaume, the Minister of Health. But the pace at which policy is implemented in Haiti is slower than in Rwanda, but it's also slower in every other country we've worked in. You know? In Russia, one reason things went well quickly was inside the prison system, which is a federal system. But the rest of the system outside the prison is district focused. It's like the United States, different policies from different states. So it's hard. So I think the way we've had an effect has been through policy change, which is slow, but also through teaching and training. Mir Bale Hospital is a national university hospital, right? Even though there's no university there, we insist that it is a national hospital. It's actually the largest training center right now for doctors, nurses, surgeons, even larger probably than uh, the general hospital because you know, we have more staff stuff, space and system, just the numbers. I don't know if that's true, but it's close. Certainly the surgical services and trauma services are much busier, and that's how you train surgeons, surgical nurses, anesthesiologists, and nurse anesthetists. So I think we're having a national impact. And we'd like to have an international impact in Haiti, and we did through our Haitian colleagues who went to Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, et cetera. Is that a good enough answer? I hope you get to visit. It's a, it's a wonderful place, Mibale, and Haiti in general. Malloy, another one of my people, like Garrett. <laughs> Garrett left. No, there he is. Yeah, she's a good lady. Great question, thank you very much. Well, the answer is yes, it already has. So in Rwanda, what happens when you see deaths due to infections, those big three plummet, and same you know, AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria, you knock out vaccine-preventable illness, 93% uh, of all 13-year-old girls in Rwanda, back to Garrett's point, were vaccinated against human papilloma virus, which is, causes most cases of cervical cancer. I think the number in American cities is under a third, right? Which is pretty sad, right? The richest, most powerful medical power can't get its public health act together. Um, so they will also see a decline in cervical cancer, right? But what they've seen now is the lines are crossing. If you do just the old school, you know, communicable, non-communicable, they're crossing. Right, so, and you add to that major mental illness, which can be fatal, as you know, um, through you know, a number of tragic means. Um, so you you're really, or, that's already happening. Now, I, here's what I would say, given that that's already come to pass, and it will come to pass whenever there are strong systems. Um, we can't pit prevention against care, again. I got hit by a car. I didn't want anybody to say to me, should have looked both ways before you cross the street. Trauma is the leading killer of American children and young adults. We have trauma deserts, and even in urban areas where you just can't get good trauma care quickly. You know? Some of it is self-inflicted, some of it's not. Right? And it is also the leading killer of kids in a lot of African countries. So if we don't address cancer, major mental illness, trauma, you know, heart disease, diabetes, we're just gonna lose a lot of people. We have to avoid saying, nope, Ebola is more important than acute heart attack. I don't believe it. I mean, whatever ails people is important. 
So keep on your studies on that. Yeah. Well, let me just say um, that I would say that undergraduates in general have been huge supporters of Partners in Health. Face Aids, uh, just to name one that started in, in, uh, in Stanford and spread across the country. This is some time ago. Now that's been merged with Partners in Health Engage, PIG Engage. That's a, dominated by undergrads. Uh, and there it is, right across the street. I, is anybody here part of PIH Engage? My people. <laughs> so I mean, th this is not just about mobilizing resources, although I think those of us lucky enough to live in a place like this should do that. It's about organizing, period, you know, and taking on questions like the young Mr. M future Dr. McCoy Malloy just raised. Just kidding. You can do what you want. <laughs> so I, I think, I mean, just to, the, the whole, problem, one of my friends who's here, Paul Davis, who um, has worked with ACT UP, you know, one of the reasons that we have antiretroviral therapy in places like Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho is because, you know, of organizing and major investments that came out of that. So I think that's always in your, in your reach. And I can also tell you, remember what I said rather humbly, I hope, with a little bit of humor, but humbly, I don't like bragging that I wrote such a stupid thesis, you know? That's ignorance, you know? And I, I, I made up for that in college, but I didn't brag when I was in college. When I came here to Harvard Medical School, I did not say, hey, you want to hear about the high school thesis I wrote? You know, it took me 10 years to say, well, that's instructive. And where did that come from? It came from learning in a classroom. In fact, everything that I'm doing now, including Having applied to Harvard Medical School, I applied to Harvard Medical School because there was an MD-PhD program in anthropology, and I read about that in a class at Duke. So I mean, you know, the good news is that you can learn from classes, and the other good news is that's what you're supposed to be doing here. He likes my humor. <laughs> so I'm, I'm just saying from organizing to, you know, self-improvement which is the great privilege of a great university like VU, you know, it, it's just, and then, of course, engagement with local problems. As has been pointed out, we have serious healthcare delivery problems, even in a city that's considered a medical superpower like Boston. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Oh. You can't pry me out of here. Yeah, endemic, and you mean local? Yeah. Well, it's a great question, all right? And uh, sorry, it, you know, what are some of the endemic responses? And I just wanted to say local. And is local a good enough word? Yeah. Well, first of all, I showed you, I regard my colleagues who died as heroes and martyrs. And I hope you could, I didn't really want to use that language because they wouldn't have liked it, right? But that's, to me, an endemic response of heroism. Humar Khan, and there were many, many more across the world. Just like I'm very grateful for the Americans who put themselves in harm's way in order to help other people. That's an endemic response. There are 500 healthcare professionals who died of Ebola in Sierra Leone, in Liberia, in Guinea. And, uh, you know, we, we should never forget their sacrifice. A um, lot of articles in the newspaper about people fleeing their post. Not the people I knew. You know, they knew what was coming and they, they tried. So that's, call it heroism. I, I, I think, I hope I never forget. I, I have no intention of ever forgetting them. Um, other endemic responses, caregiving in general. 
And I think that's another reason. Families, knowing that their children, mothers, fathers had Ebola, they took care of them anyway. You could say, well, that was foolish. They're dead now. I would never say that. You know, I think that if they had had the support they needed, you know, from us, not because we're non-endemic, not be support from us, meaning as humans, right, with the staff stuff, space, and systems. And you know, I don't know if you've been to that part of the world, but you're young, and you know, there was once a Sierra Leone in Liberia. They were never strong, perhaps medically, but it wasn't the wasteland that was there since the war and during the war. And uh, so endemic responses are curtailed by taking out heroes, taking out caregivers, taking out doctors, brain drain, on and on. And in spite of all those losses, um, I think what I have taken out of the last 18 months was that the failure was not largely the local failure, the endemic failure. That was heroism, bravery, you know, professionalism that we could have done more to help early on. And I, I, I still regret, and will always regret, I'm proud of that we got there, but it's a long time between June and October. And when I left there, I knew that my friends were in peril, my colleagues. There's no question Ebola was in Freetown, Ebola was in Monrovia, Ebola was everywhere. And, you know, we just didn't know it because we not, not looking for it. We didn't have the staff stuff, space, and system. So that's what strikes me most, you know. And the mistrust, the mistrust of the biomedical system. First of all, there wasn't a biomedical system, I just said. To the, anybody here from Liberia? Anybody been to Liberia? Sure, you? Okay, so Liberia right now has under 50 practicing doctors. That would mean that in the city of Boston, you have 16 doctors. I, know, I can't walk across my office at Harvard Medical School without bumping into 16 per minute. You know? <laughs> so even without you know, a medical, a lot of medical professionals, people, you know, they tried to take care of each other. You know, I think that should be honored and remembered as an endemic, a local, a genuine local response. Because after war, when meetings are spoiled, to say nothing of the long war against people for 500 years, which was the trade, you know, meetings get spoiled if you had seen a complete collapse of normative behavior and normative structures. I don't think a lot of sociologists or anthropologists would be surprised, but you didn't see that. You saw communities hanging together, families hanging together, neighbors, you know, hanging together. The mistrust was really of outsiders. And I'm asking you, who who knows anything about the history of Liberia and Sierra Leone, and Guinea for that matter, would say that they should have a lot of trust of outsiders. You have to earn the trust. So I had nothing but warm welcome there. Doctors get a free break and nurses too, but we still have to earn the trust. And when we do that, we can really tap into endemic resources, which I think human capital is the best thing they got. What do they want to do? They want to do what you're doing. They want to go to school, they want to have, you go to, like I did, universities, training, become nurses, doctors, epidemiologists, managers, business people. But we got to, since the war, you know, those, those uh, possibilities have been largely closed to them. And, and we, that, that would be a great thing for us to do, you know, as partners, especially the United States, which has all this connection to Liberia. Anyway, that's my two cents. How'd I do? Good. Oh, thanks, Lord. <laughs> my friend here in the fourth row. Hi, Dr. Barber. My name is uh, Ramos Arrow. Uh, I'm from Nepal. And I'm uh, also a medical student and public health student here. My people. He's not my people. He, won't, he says, yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. My question is a follow-up question to that one. Uh, uh, Red dress? The, yeah. About, about the epidemiological left. transition that we oh, yeah. uh, we're Mr. Sure Malloy. how there's more chronic diseases, and especially with disasters uh, around the world, uh, there's you know, high mortality and morbidity, which is true. 
exactly. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, uh, do you think the health systems in, in the developing world are focused a lot around infectious disease control and infection, and are we not focusing, focusing enough on natural disasters and climate change? Yeah. Okay, I will do that. I will do that. I'm sorry. Totally busted. I'm working on it. Okay, first of all, when you say, are we focusing too much on infectious diseases, I just gave you an example where there's no focus on infectious diseases and no focus on non-communicable chronic disease. Neither. There is no focus on anything where there isn't a healthcare system. So I think if you're a public health student and a medical student or a physician, are you a physician already? Medical. Yeah. What I would beg of you is that you refuse that either or approach, prevention versus care, and non-communicable versus communicable. Is if it is a disease of poor people, in Nepal, as in Liberia, it is by definition a neglected disease. So when people say NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, I want to say they're all neglected. Right? Cancer, take cervical cancer. That's an infectious disease, not a non communicable disease. It's neglected. You know, so I think the, the thing, again, I wish someone would have said to me instead of doing the either or stuff I got a lot of, what would have been look at the burden of disease and then look at gaps. Burden, gap, burden, gap. You know, I'd like to hammer that into my head, right? What ails the Nepali people? Right? That's your job if you're going to practice there. It's your job anyway as a Nepali. But, and again, another post-violence, although it's not the 500 years there. It's a, it's, a, it's a remarkably gentle people there in spite of all the poverty and, and war, right? the Civil War. Um, that's not really what happened in, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, I think you'll agree, it was very different and much more long-standing. But I think the burden gap analysis is easy enough for someone like you to do, um, and that there, it's an imperfect thing to look at a burden, the burden of disease. You, don't, you know you'll miss things, but just ask what makes people suffer and die, suffer and die, because major mental illness will be on the list, including after an earthquake. You know, if you compare trauma orthopedic trauma to m mental illness, not in an either or way, but then mental illness, that kind of trauma is going to outweigh orthopedic trauma. And uh, so that's something I would do, is get prepared for the arguments, either or, and then prepare yourself by knowing the burden of the disease. And then also as a young physician, find things that you want to do. Like I already confess, I like being in a hospital. It's not because the burden of disease is there, it's because of what I like to do. But I work with a big group, Partners in Health, or in a big healthcare system, big partners we call it, the Brigham's part of that. And I don't have to be all things to all people. I get to do what I like, teach, focus on you know, people with lots of serious illnesses at once, cancer and infectious disease, for example, surgical infection, knowing that I get to work with people who do focus on burden of disease and gap. Gap, by the way, is what we're ignoring. And just like in Nepal, just like in Liberia, people have been ignoring not just chronic non-communicable disease, but serious illness, cancer. Ebola, you wouldn't want Ebola to be treated you know, in it by a community health worker, right? You'd want, if you're already sick with Ebola, that's what happened to my two friends, right? They didn't get critical care or even supportive care. So anyway, I, I, I will read my email. Sorry. Okay, and we'll talk more. And I think that there's very good things for you. So how about you adhere to this? I'm not going anywhere, so don't okay. don't cut me, you know. If she's gonna cut me off, then I will see you right after. Is that okay? Is that, is that okay? Thank you guys.